All right, let's start with the contents of this course. Um, we'll start off with part, um, part one, the introduction. There are three lessons under part one. It's lesson one is technical analysis. Lesson two, the types of traders. Lesson three, confluence. Part two um, tackles the technical tools. Lesson one, we have sports and resistances. Lesson two, we have trends and the 50% rule. Lesson three, we'll talk about moving averages. Lesson four, we have the relative strength index. Lesson five, Darvas boxes. Lesson six, the Fibonacci ratio. And for part three, we have some special topics on parabolics, stock picking, and others. For lesson two, I'll provide you with examples of some trade setups. So part one, the introduction, or things you probably already know, but I will tell you about anyway. Um, a lot of you already traded the markets for one or two years or even more. Some are just beginners. Um, some are intermediate traders. And yet some of the members of the HPT group are already experienced traders, but need to be reminded about the rules of trading or some very effective setups that they may have forgotten about in searching for the perfect um, trading system. Okay, um, so if you're already experienced or you're a past student, um, it really is up to you whether you want to come back later for the later courses, but I will begin the course assuming that um, a lot of you are just beginners. Um, I would like to start from the beginning because I want to set the, I mean, uh, create a clear mindset for all of you to follow. Um, erase what you know from the past, from the trading systems that you have probably been using but have not been successful at. So I'm starting the course with a lesson on supports and resistances. A lot of you already know that for sure, but nonetheless, I would like to it to serve as a reminder of the basic the very basic um, rules in trading, which is related to uh, finding the support and the resistances. All right, for the introduction. 90% of traders lose money in the stock market. Some people may claim they're gurus. Some people may claim that they never experienced a loss. They're lying. Okay. No one picks winning stocks every single time. We can't predict the market, but we know we have to know how to handle the losses in this market. Knowing how to handle the losses will make the difference between a small loss that will let you get back quickly in the game and the huge loss that can damage your portfolio and your confidence. Now, we've all been there. And more than just a game of profit and losses, the stock market is a battle of the mind. On top of studying charts, number crunching, speculating on volumes and patterns, you also have to deal with the fact that you have your hard-earned money on the line. This is money you earn from your work abroad, profits from your business, from your household savings. This is why buying and selling stocks is personal. We've all experienced a range of emotions, not just fear and greed. We also get euphoria when your stock gaps up on earnings or depression when it gaps down. Moreover, there's the emotional state of the investor, such as overconfidence or the Superman complex after a good run of profits. Or sometimes we feel like a moron after a string of loses, losers. But really, how you handle those emotions will go a long, long way toward determining how much money you make 
and how much money you keep in the stock market. The investors who shoot from the hip and react to every wiggle in the market generally do poorly. Those who have a well thought out plan are usually the ones that excel. But no matter who you are and what the market does, you're going to experience some losses on the trades in the months and years ahead. And it's vital to think of them in that way. But when you use a system that you have perfected for yourself, you're putting the odds in your favor. But that does not mean that the odds will always win you out. Stock losses are simply part of the process, and that goes for everyone, whether newbies or professionals. The difference is that novices personalize the losses and never learn from them. Professionals realize that losses are inevitable in the stock market and learn from them. So if you're feeling down about your stock losses, you just have to get a better mindset. You have to look to learn from your losses as opposed to being weighed down by them. You were born to win, but to be a winner, you must plan to win, prepare to win, and expect to win. This is Charmaine, and welcome to our webinar, High Probability Trades. All right, I'd like to um, tell you a little about this webinar, the High Probability Trades webinar. Okay. First of all, I wanted to do this webinar for you today because um, I like trading third-liner stocks, second-liner sometimes, but rarely blue chips. And I wanted to give you this guy. I wanted to give you guys the secret about trading these kinds of stocks. So I could lead you up to that um, exciting moment, but I thought I could give you the secret straight away, and we can spend the next few minutes going over going over a couple of charts and talking about technical tools and how you could apply it on a daily basis. But it's important to understand that these are just tools. There's nothing mystical or magical about them. But when employed properly in combination, they will provide you with some enormously profitable, high reward, low risk trading opportunities that you can take advantage of every single day. So we will look at these tools both from a medium trader standpoint and also from a day trader standpoint. But before we proceed to use these tools, I would like to orient you about um, more about this webinar and about the high probability trades community. Okay. Firstly, this webinar assumes the following. The attendees have a traded the markets for at least a month. The attendees have access to charting software, whether through their own online broker or their personal charting software. Attendees have beginner to intermediate charting skills. So what should you expect from the webinar? So rather than discussing theories of technical analysis and indicators, expect to see these theories in action on actual charts. We prefer a big picture view of the charts rather than focus on a single indicator and how it could be used in trades. We want to focus on the confluences of these indicators as well as the time frames to determine entry and exit. Expect to be baffled at first, but to find clarity later. So what not to expect? Fundamental analysis. I'm allergic. I don't read the papers. Of course, inevitably, I get to read them because people forward news to me over at Facebook. But I don't do fundamental analysis because it affects your judgment. Do not expect top stock tips because I'm not a fortune teller. And do not expect answers to questions like, what do you think of B? Or what do you think of food, etc. As a student, I would expect you to share your opinion, post the chart, and then people can weigh in on what they think about your charts. So about the 
high probability trades community. The core HPT community is comprised of 49 members who have generously donated to the Stock Market Pilipinas charity project at the beginning of the year. We are a group of unique individuals, new, intermediate, and experienced traders um, who hone our trading skills with the group by sharing charts, watching the market, collaborating ideas, and executing trades, win or lose, every day. But we do not trade as a group. No? We do not have group trades. Each is responsible for his own trade, but we would like to support each other's professional growth as a stock trader. So as I said, we are a community of sharers. We don't front run each other. We don't hype each other. We just share charts. Where to find us? Um, we're at Slack. We're also at Facebook. We use HPT2 Slack.com for our conversations every day. The HPT webinar, this is where we would expect to um, upload charts for studies for academic purposes. These um, Slack pages are new, so bear with me. I'm sorry if I had to have you register to many of them last week because we lost many of our, ch our charts and our conversations in our previous Slack page because we had, um, we're using the free option, so Slack deleted our previous conversations because they exceeded the maximum of 10,000. So we had to create a new um, Slack page. Um, so we opted to use the Facebook page instead for posting our charts. Okay, you, you're already invited and that's Facebook page. We have the HPT chart setups. That includes the archive of old charts, just in case you want to see how um, we chart or for academic purposes as well. You can visit which charts have been successful, which were not. You can check out the dates on those um, archives and cross-reference those dates with the charts, whether those stocks actually um, moved on that day or in that week or in that, or in that particular um, particular um, with that particular setup in mind we have HPT charts of the day this was this is our newer archive but again I don't want to post charts there anymore I guess we should just post charts on the Facebook page so that everybody um, will be looking at the same page every day so priority is to use the slack 2.com for the chat and the Facebook page for the charts now, I don't use AMI Broker. I know many of you do. So I'm a big cheapskate, so I don't want to spend money on a new computer just to run AMI Broker because my the AMI Broker does not run on my Mac. So I use Call, Call Financials Charts, which works perfectly for me. I use it on Firefox or Safari, and I use the Java charts, the, the oldest charts they have because I've gotten used to it. So... For this webinar, we'd like to have the same chart settings. No, so, so if um, when you have time or after this webinar, you can change your settings to the following. Now select linear, linear charts, and then set your exponential moving averages to 4, 8, and 21. You can... You may or may not change the color to green, yellow, and red. Um, this was suggested by my good friend um, because visually, it makes it easier for you to see buy and sell signals on a chart when you have these three colors. These are three. These three are traffic light color. Uh, when there's a buy signal, you will see these three colors arranged as a traffic light formation: green, yellow, and Red, so that's a buy signal. And when the formation changes, that's automatically a sell signal. Okay, so this is optional. But he gave me a very good idea, so I am applying it to my charts as well. So optional, optionally change the colors. And then I occasionally use short, um, simple moving averages as well. 
but unclick SMA1 because we already have EMA21 which more or less travels the same path as SMA1 because um, yeah so you don't need SMA1 anymore SMA2 set it to 50 SMA3 is 100 your regular call settings would have I think 65 and 120 or 60 and 120 I don't remember um, this ensures us that moving averages that we have on our charts are a bit faster than what the rest of call users have so we get the signals faster than many call users if we use shorter term moving averages so add the relative strength index the settings are 30, 30, and 70. So this is for the Firefox or Safari version of call using the Java. But if you're using the HTML chart on Chrome or any other um, charting software for MakeTrade, First Metro, or other providers, um, still, just put the same settings in, EMA1 is equal to 4, EMA2 is equal to 8, EMA3 is equal to 21, choose exponential, change the colors, add the SMAs, add the RSI, 30, 30, 70. Okay, so moving on. Let's talk about technical analysis. Technical analysis or charting is the study of price and volume behavior in financial markets in order to anticipate rather than forecast or predict their future performance. We say anticipate because we can only guess. We cannot actually forecast. We don't really know what's going to happen in the future. But we can anticipate that this stock is about to break out or this stock is about to break down. The market can go up or down any time. It is only the probability of each move that varies. It can go both ways, but we have to know what's the probability of it going up, what is the probability of it breaking down. Technical analysis is just technical analysis. It's not an exact science. It's subject to um, a lot of prejudice. Huh? What one guru might say is bullish, another might think is bearish. So it's not an exact science. Technical analysis should not be used to make predictions because we never know the outcome of a particular pattern or series of events with 100% certainty. The best that we can hope to achieve is a probability of around 80% for any particular outcome, which means that something unexpected will occur at least one in five times. Most of the time, however, we can tell that price is at least twice as likely to move in a certain direction as it is to move in the other. That is sufficient edge for a trader to outperform the market. So there are three assumptions of technical analysis. The first is the market discounts everything. This is why I don't read newspapers. I check disclosure sometimes but I hardly read comments on forums because they mess with my analysis. But I am a moderator for Stock Market Pilipinas. Um, what else? The field of technical analysis, number one, the market discounts everything. A major criticism of technical analysis is that it only considers price movement and ignores the company's fundamentals. However, Technical analysis assumes that at any given time, a stock's price reflects everything that has or could affect the company fundamentally. Everything is priced in, including broader economic factors and market psychology. So as traders, we only need to analyze price movement or the relationship between supply and demand for a particular stock in the market. The second assumption is that price moves in trends. Most technical trading strategies are based on the assumption that price follows trends. 
After a trend has been established, the future price movement is more likely to be in the same direction as the trend than to be against it. The third, history repeats itself. The repetitive nature of price movements is attributed to market psychology. In other words, the market tends to react in the same way to market stimuli every time. Technical analysis uses chart patterns to analyze market movements and to understand trends. An important part of being a good trader is knowing what kind of trader you are. Lesson two, the types of traders. So are you a scalper, a day trader, a swing trader, or a position trader? Excuse me. It is important for you to discover this aspect of yourself in order to determine what types of trades you can take on. As we go along, you will find several words appear randomly on some slides. Kindly take note of these words as we will discuss these later. Scalping is fast and furious, risky but highly rewarding. It's fast-paced, exciting, mind-rattling, even nauseating all at once. These types of trades are open and closed within a few seconds to a few minutes at the most. The main objective for scalpers is to grab very small amounts of gains as many times as they can throughout the busiest times of the day. Scalpers have to be glued to the charts while their positions are open and must provide undivided attention to their trading. If you want to be a scalper, you must be intensely focused and think quickly and act on decisions with conviction. Scalpers do not seek big gains in trades. They make money by raking in small profits over many, on many trades over time. To be a scalper, you have to have the skill to trade fast. You have to be able to provide undivided attention to the trade all day. Scalping is for people who do not have the patience to wait for long trades. It's also for people who can think fast and change bias or direction quickly. Most importantly, scalpers have to have fast fingers. Scalpers use minutes charts for entry and exits. They try to catch breakouts in price charts and ride the uptrend. They're not too picky about selling prices because a minimum of 4% gain is a good reward for a few minutes of work. A scalper can trade on, based on use, news or events, but he can also use technical tools like Darvas boxes and exponential moving averages in combination. He trades breakouts primarily because breakouts ensure fast profits. He trades breakouts and rides it while it lasts. But if the trade goes against the scalper, he cuts losses immediately. Here's an example of a trade using Darvas boxes and the three minute chart as time frame. This is a kind of trade a scalper would probably get into. So most of you probably traded thugs last week some got burnt, some earned. But I was telling my friends at HPT that time that this chart was so um, meticulously drawn that I wanted to chart it right after trading. So here it is for you. Um, while the scalper is interested only in trading a few minutes within a day, he has to see the big picture. So you would see that this um, chart started from August 31 and ended on September 6, 2016. You have to see the bigger picture in order to make trading decisions on a minutes basis as well. Here we see that prices stayed within box ranges. 
a scalper buys at the break of the box at 185 during the morning session of September 2. And then he writes the trend. The trend is stopped out at around 220, is stopped at around 220 and created the box pattern. When that when prices broke down from that box pattern, the scalper would sell his entire position and then price breaks down. So when price breaks down, the scalper would have already taken his profits because this is not his objective to stay long in the trade. He does not wait for the end of the day. He just waits for a sell signal and then takes all his profits. Aside from the Darvas boxes, a scalper could use moving averages as well to find buy and sell signals call, called crossovers. So a, sell sig a buy signal was generated on the break of the box coupled with a breakout in price and a buy signal from the exponential moving averages. Another example of a scalper's trade might be Medco Holdings, early last week as well. Um, Medco Holdings created the bullish chart pattern on its three-minute chart. This is a cup and handle pattern. The pattern is verified by the volume. A scalper will not rely on the pattern alone because chart patterns often fail but there's still a good guide in determining the bullishness or the bearishness of a stock. A scalper would not only look at the pattern, he will also look at bullish signals from moving averages. So here's the pattern, and there's the moving averages. You would see that in this chart, green is above yellow and yellow is above red. So that's a buy signal. This is coupled with a gap. If you see that arrow there, there's a huge gap. That means a strong buy signal was generated right at the open. Uh, not, not right at the open, right at the cross above the blue line, which is SMA 100. So a gap is just as good as a long green candle when determining the bullishness of a price movement. So when the price crossed above 1 peso on that day, a breakaway gap, and a bullish crossover occurred on the moving averages. As a confirmation, price also crossed above the SMA 100, which is the blue line. You have one, the cup and handle pattern, two, the bullish EMA crossover, three, and the cross above the simple moving average 100 days. That's what we call a confluence. There are many factors that contributed to the bullishness of that price movement at that particular time. So there are enough reasons for us to enter the trade. Now, after that buy signal, the handle pattern formed and the pattern materialized and was completed at 138 on the next day. Now, if you were a scalper, you would already have been out of the trade at the tip of the, um, before the handle formed at the tip of the cup. And then you'd be waiting for another breakout. That breakout happened the next day. So a scalper would not keep his position till the end of the day. He would not sleep on it. He would sell it and come back the next day and trade that same stock again because he sees that there's a bullish pattern forming at the close. So the bottom line is, Scalpers are a unique set of individuals who are known to conduct dozens of or hundreds of trades throughout the trading day. Again, scalpers by their nature are often high-energy individuals who thrive during th times of stress and who have the means and temperament to handle the high volume of trades. Of course, locally, our trades are um, not as... Um, high-tech as what they have on Wall Street. So we can only trade manually a number of trades a day. So we probably trade a maximum of, scalpers probably trade a maximum of around 10 trades each day. So you have to ask yourself, are you a scalper? 
If you're a scalper, then you have to focus on the minutes charts and keep studying that and that alone. You need to concentrate on a particular area of study in order to excel at that. You can't be a scalper and a day trade and, and a position trader and a swing trader and be good at all of it. You have to choose a particular area or a, choose a primary focus. Now, the second type of trader is a day trader. Day traders, unlike scalpers, typically take on one trade a day and close it out when the day is over. Just like the scalper, they don't like trading, holding their trades overnight. If you think scalping is too fast, but swing trading is a bit slow, um, then trade, day trading might be for you. A day trader may have probably around three or less trades a day. He'd wait for a trade to finish by the end of the day or wait for a sell signal. But his objective is not to trade as much as possible. It's to trade a single stock and maximize the profits on that single stock. So you might be a day trader if you like beginning and ending the day, a trade within the day. You have time to analyze the market before the trading opens. You can monitor the market all day. And you would like to know whether you won or lost at the end of the day. The time frame used by day, day traders is the daily chart. But he supplements it with the minutes charts to refine his entry and exit. There are two kinds of day traders. One does big breakout trading and the other one does trend trading. Let's talk about breakout trading first. Breakout day trading is when you find price breakouts from resistance levels and then make a buy decision and ride the trade. This is quite similar to what the scalper does, but unlike the scalper, the trader holds the position for most of the day. Here's an example of a day trade. Prior to the market open, I drew this sun chart. Um, I drew the support and resistance levels, as well as the Fibonacci levels and the Darvas box. Then I made a day trading plan. The reasons to buy this was that, one, it broke above simple moving average, 100-day simple moving average. Two, it broke above the box resistance of 106. Three, it broke above the 50 level. I created the trade plan. The plan was to buy at 107 and then to sell at the sell zone between 38.2% and 23.6% Fibonacci levels. That's a value of 112 to 120 to 122. And then my cut loss is if price breakout fails and goes below 106. Then I computed the risk reward ratio. At the entry price of 107 and the cut loss price of 106, my risk was 0 0.01. The reward is 112 minus 1.07 is 0 0.05. So the risk is 0 0.01. The reward is 0 0.05, so it's a 1 is to 5 ratio. So that to me is a good risk and reward ratio. As a rule of thumb, a good risk to reward ratio is one wherein the reward outweighs the risk 4 to 1 or 1 to 4, risk versus reward at 1 to 4. So don't trade um, stocks where your risk reward ratio is less than 1 is to 4. I mean, greater than one is to four. Mm. Having followed the plan, um, the average gain would be between 2.8% to 4.6% for the 
for sales between 112 high and 110 end of day price. So if you're a day trader and you would prefer to sell everything at the end of the day, that price would have been 110 for Sun on that day. If you sold at that price, your gain would be 2.8%. But if you're lucky enough to be able to sell at the highs, your gain would have been 4.6%. So another type of day trading is trend trading. This is also referred to as trend following. The first thing a trader does is to spot the trend. In which direction are prices going? Let's say you have two charts. One stock is on an uptrend while the other is on a downtrend. Which trade would you take? Would you rather trade the ranges of an uptrending stock or would you rather trade the ranges of a downtrending stock? Which trade would you take? Well, a rule of thumb in trading in general is to always choose the easier trade. If you buy a stock that's on an uptrend and purchase it at the wrong place, you still have a chance to get out because the stock is on an uptrend. But if you buy a stock at the wrong level in a stock that's on a downtrend, the most that you can do is minimize your losses and sell at the bounces, which is not a guarantee. Let's say you choose the uptrend. Which of these uptrends would you rather trade? Would you rather trade A, an uptrend with an angle of 30 degrees, or uptrend B with an angle of 45 degrees? Of course, a trend trader prefers to trade B because this uptrend has a higher price low. So when you scan your charts, you have to look at how fast the stock is moving. Just because it has a good setup doesn't mean you should trade it. You have to filter it even more to choose which will give me more gains in the less amount of time. So if you're a day trader, only trade stocks which follow a strong uptrend, are highly volatile, and are currently resting at the EMA4 line at yesterday's close. So if yesterday, it is the price is not resting on the EMA4 line, the tendency is for the price to stabilize and to correct back down. So you want stocks that have already finished consolidating and are right back at the support line. The chances of a stock going, uh, the chances of a stock giving you some gains for the day, if it's at the support line, is higher than the stocks which are above or far above the support line. So how do you trade an uptrending stock? This is for day trade. I'm reminding you that this is just for day trades, okay? For one day only. Draw the upper and lower trend lines. Buy at the open if the opening price is resting on the EMA4 line. Sell when the price touches the upper trend line or sell at the close. Alternatively, you can use the minutes chart to refine your exit during the day. Cut losses if price drops below the EMA4 line. So here's an example of day trading a trend using the daily chart. I've been day trading MRC every single, almost every single day, and it's never been out of my portfolio. I buy it, I sell it, I buy it back at the end of the day. Or if price is too high at the end of the day, I buy it back the next day. It's highly volatile. And as you can see, every time it touches the upper trend line, it goes back down and goes back to the EMA4 line. So you already know that that's the safest place to buy and the most profitable place to buy. So MRC is a highly volatile stock, stock sorry, that adheres to its EMA4. Every time price bounces off the EMA4 line, it makes a big move of at least 4%, which is 
quite a good gain for a day's work. The day trader takes advantage of its volatility by buying at EMA4 and selling it at its peak near the upper trend line. So as you can see, you're not supposed to trade this part of the chart. This is a downtrend. The one with the X is a downtrend. Even if the stock is highly volatile, do, you have to choose the period in which it is tradable. At the X mark, it's going sideways, so do not trade that. Only trade it when it starts going up. So ask yourself, are you a day trader? The next type of trader is a swing trader. Swing trading is a long-term trading style that requires patience. I tried this a few times, but I failed at it. I'm a very bad swing trader because I never have the patience to hold on to a stock that makes me wait for more than a week for a gain. Swing trading is a longer term trading style that requires patience to hold on to your trades for several days at a time. It is ideal for those who cannot monitor their charts, but can dedicate a few hours each day analyzing the market. So if you have a full time job, but you have enough time to study charts at the end of the day or the start of the day, then this option is a good fit for you. You might want to be a good trade uh, uh, you might want to be a string trade swing trader if you don't mind having you don't mind holding your trades for several days you don't mind holding trades you know, for more than one day you're willing to take on fewer trades but you're more careful to make sure that your trades have very good setups you don't mind having large stop losses so at times during um, the stocks move, you'd have a gain, and then the next day, these gains are all gone. You have to be patient, and you have to be able to remain calm when the trade moves against you. Swing traders mainly use weekly charts, but refine their entries using daily charts. Here's an example of a swing trade. This is the chart of EW or East West. Clearly, you can see that the stock is an uptrend. Since prices do not go up in a straight line, retracements are an opportunity to buy. So there's a retracement right there. You buy that. And then ex experiences a peak right there. You sell that. How do you know that this is the place to sell? You use a combination of Trend lines, moving averages, crossovers, candlestick analysis. To find out whether this is the top, you can also use the RSI indicator. So you buy there, you sell there. You make another buy when it retraces. You sell at the peak. Then you make another buy. So how do you determine the entry and exit points? For every price thrust above the previous high, the swing trader waits for the price to retrace around 50% of the up thrust. 50% of the up thrust. So you get the difference between the high and the low. Take 50% of that. That is likely to be the point where the price will bounce. For a stock that is trending um, bullishly, So retrace to 50%, buy it, and then sell it on the next peak at the resumption of the trend. You use a combination of technical tools to determine where this retracement will be. Moving on. <coughs> Excuse me. The next type of trader is the position trader. Position traders like long-term. 
They can have traits that last for several weeks to several months to several years. This kind of trading is reserved for the very patient traders. The general trend is what matters most to you, so you would use the monthly charts primarily, if at all. Thus, your stop losses will be very large. Here's a 10-year chart for Meralco. If you are a position trader, you would be holding positions in buying or adding at the bottom trend line. See, um, you use the monthly chart for your analysis because you're on long-term hold. You draw the bottom and the upper trend line, and you place your buys at the bottom trend line. You could swing trade this, but because you're a position trader, you're probably very busy or you don't care about um, quick profits, probably care about the dividends or the stability or the um, just being exposed to the market. So in summary, it is important to know what type of trader you are so you could select the best possible trade for your personality. Are you a position trader? Are you a day trader? Are you a swing trader? Knowing yourself is key to being a successful trader. So earlier, I asked you to note down what trading tools we mentioned in the, pre in the previous lessons. So what main tools did we discuss? As we discussed the different types of trades and the different types of traders, we mentioned the following. We mentioned trend, supports and resistances, Darvas boxes, moving averages, time frames, Fibonacci retracements, chart patterns, volumes, RSI, and others. We will go through each technical tool and then tie them up together in a successful trade. Now, an important aspect of successful trading is about finding the right entry and exit points. When two or more technical tools converge to show bullishness in the price chart, we enter the trade. When two or more technical tools converge to show bearishness in a price chart, we exit the trade. So we only have enough resources at our hands or enough cash in our portfolio that we have to effectively use it. We have to maximize the use of whatever resources we have. So we have to make sure that if we make any purchase, that is the best possible entry price. And when we sell, th when we sell our positions, that's the best possible exit price. No matter if you have millions in your portfolio or you have a few hundred thousands or you have a few thousands, it is still important for you to reserve your bullets for the most efficient trade setups. Remember to protect your capital at all times. Now, there's one key word here that increases the chances of successful trades from start to finish. That word is confluence. What is confluence? Confluence is an agreement. It is an agreement between time frames, indicators, chart patterns, etc. The more rational there is for a trade, the more the higher probability that trade will be. So just in case this, the RSI tells you that's oversold, does not mean you should buy it. You have to find more reasons other than just the RSI. Use other technical tools to back up the RSI. Because even technical, ind technical indicators are not 100% um, sure, uh, are not 100% certainty that they will be successful or that they're pointing to the right direction. Confluence is stacking the odds in your favor. 
We will be using the different tools that we have at our disposal to decide whether we are going to enter or exit the trade. Now, I am looking at the chart and I'm seeing a story being told. I see buyers on one side. I see momentum or trend going in one direction. We see the support and the resistance levels. We see a breakout and all of this is telling me the same story in terms of entering the trade. As a trader, you have to listen to that story. You have to listen to what the chart is telling you so that you could make a high probability trade. So to summarize part one, there are three important points. First, technical analysis is the study or charting of price action. It is not an exact science. You can only anticipate you cannot predict. Two, the key to being a successful trader is knowing who you are. Three, confluence is key to higher probability trades. Now let's go to part two, the technical tools. Lesson one, supports and resistances. I would like to present to you the ch monthly chart of First Philippine Holdings or FPH. The price for FPH had ranged between its resistance zone of 113.8 to 99.25 and its support zone between 48.90 and 52.75 from 2013 to 2016. From its peak in 2013, the price dropped and halted at the 48.90 level. This price point will be used in the future as a potential bottom of the support zone. From that bottom, there was a strong bounce. Price rallied until 2015. However, it was met by strong resistance at the historical resistance zone between 113.8 and 9925. This was the same resistance as the resistance zone in 2013. Thus, a strong downtrend followed. Now, it was again halted at the support area that was established in 2013. Currently, another bounce is underway in 2016. So you already know that FPH had met its strong support and currently it's already bouncing. This is a very slow stock, but it's very stable and very predictable. So this is a good position for, uh, this is a good um, stock for position traders to buy. The market sees the support and resistance zones as strong pivot areas because of two elements. You have the duration and the volume. The support level has been respected for three years from 2013 to 2016. The amount of volume that has been traded at the support and resistance zones were above the average monthly volume. Volume capitulated, volume capitulated and indicated a huge buying, while volume capitulation at resistance zones indicated huge selling. Check out this volume price chart for FPH. Notice the average volumes. Also notice how volumes have increased dramatically at this resistance zone. The dramatic increase in volume is called capitulation. Volume capitulated at pivot points or turning points in the price. So what is support? A support level is the price at which buyers are expected to enter the market in sufficient numbers to take control from the sellers. What is resistance? A resistance level is the price level at which sellers are expected to enter the market in sufficient numbers to take control from buyers. Remember that supports and resistances are zones rather than exact locations or a single price in a chart. 
Now, the market has two important characteristics. First, it has a very long memory. It references historical support and resistance levels as potential buy or sell zones. Role reversal occurs when supports and resistances break. When resistance breaks, it becomes support. When support breaks, it becomes resistance. This was FPH's previous resistance zone from 10, 2010 to 2012. Now, when that level was broken, it became the new support. And it had been the support level or for at least uh, two years, sorry. So that is essentially how support and resistance levels are made. Now, the simplest way to think about support and resistances is that they are areas where the market changes direction or has stalled repeatedly. A bullish move that turns bearish has met resistance. A bearish move that turns bullish has met support. Support and resistance areas could last for minutes, hours, days, months, and even years. Markets move in relation to the strength of the bulls and the bears. So when the bulls are in control, the market pressures higher. But when the bears are in control, the market falls there. And there's always, uh, sorry, the market falls down below. And there's always a battle going on between the bulls and the bears. This is what moves markets. And this is why you see markets moving like this. On this example, you can see that the bulls are pushing the market higher, but it meets resistance. The bears cause the market to fall, but they lose control to the bulls and they meet support. When the market is moving sideways like this, the market is in a range. This is the most common way for the markets to move. But do bear in mind that charts will rarely look as neat as this or quite as easily be identified like this. So another thing to note is that then when the market does break resistance, it often becomes support. A market like this move making higher highs and higher lows is said to be in an uptrend. Moving in the opposite direction, when the market breaks support, it often becomes resistance. The market is now making lower highs and lower lows. A market moving like this is said to be in a downtrend. That is the basics of support and resistance. Lesson two, trends. Trends and the 50% rule. Before you enter a trade, first and foremost, you must look at the trend. What is a trend? A trend is a general direction in which something is developing or changing. Trends continue until major change happens, such as a breach of support or resistance. Why identify the trend? If you could identify the trend, you know where prices will find support and where it will find resistance. There are two important ways to determine trend. First, using trend lines. The second, using moving averages. Trend lines are the simplest way to determine if price is trending in any direction. A trend line must start with two points and have a third point to confirm it. An uptrend has a positive slope. Uptrend lines act as support and indicate that the net, net demand or less or demandless supply is increasing even as prices rise.
a rising price combined with increasing demand is bullish and shows a strong determination on the part of the buyers as long as prices remain above the uptrend line. The trend is the path of least resistance. Take a look at LTG. The trend is upward. It had been making higher highs and higher lows from October 2015. Now, this chart of JG Summit shows an uptrend line as well. There are at least four points at the bottom that we could connect to form a trend line. Net demand has weakened. And there's a role of a reversal of rules between support and resistance. When an upper trend line, when an uptrend line is broken, there's a role reversal, support becomes resistance, and there's an imminent change in trend. Here we see the trend line break of Bloom. The previous support line or the uptrend line now becomes resistance. Sorry. Now this is a downtrend. A downtrend line has a negative slope. In a downtrend, the net supply is increasing even as the prices decline. Now, in this bloom chart, the downtrend line is drawn by connecting a series of points on the resistance line. The second high must be lower than the first high, and the third high must be lower than the second high. The downtrend line acts as resistance. Now, when the downtrend line is broken to the upside, there is again a reversal of roles. In our market, we avoid downtrends only trade uptrends. Now, what is the 50% rule? You have identified a stock that is on an uptrend. It had been making higher lows and higher highs. At what price do you buy? We must enter a trade in the right direction and at the best possible price. The right direction is an uptrend. The best possible price is a support line. The best possible price is found during retracements. We want to know where the retracement would stop and turn around. Now, this chart shows you that while price is on an uptrend, it does not go up in a straight line. At certain points, it retraces to catch its breath and then moves back up and then retraces back down again. So what are this, these points, what are these optimal points in which we can enter the stop? When buying retracements, follow the 50% rule. For a bullish swing trade, Look for a price for, look for a bullish price thrust that clears above the previous swing high with strong momentum. Then mark out a retracement zone between 50 and 61.8% Fibonacci. After price falls down to a retracement zone, buy above any bullish bar. So you would see here that price is on an uptrend. You want to buy the retracements. Look at the 50 and 61.8% retracement levels. That is the optimal place to buy. You would notice that after an uptrend, stocks almost often fall down to the 50% level before moving back up. So measure from the top to the previous low and buy in between 50 and 61.8% retracement. So if you're using the old call chart, just right click and select Fibonacci retracement. Click on the high and then click on the low. 
we see lines and these are the Fibonacci levels. The market pulls back within these lines and provide an area of support. You will see that the pullback areas are near these 50% levels, while 61.8% being the extreme. In other words, if price fall back lower than 61.8%, you should already be cutting your losses. A healthy retracement does not exceed 61.8%. If it does, then it's probably already in a sideways pattern or in a downward pattern. You buy above any bullish bar. So after prices fall to the 50.8% 50 50 level or the 61.8% level, you wait for a green candlestick. That green candlestick tells you that it already bounced. Without that green candlestick, prices can still go down further and you end up cutting your position. So wait for a bullish candlestick before actually buying. There's the green candlestick right there. The market tends to pull back in degrees. 38%, 50%, and 61.8%. Now, Fibonacci, 50% is not a Fibonacci ratio per se, but it is an effective benchmark for a moderate pullback. So how often does this happen? It happens more often than you think. You can see how the market came back from the retracement level before moving up. If you are looking at the extreme, you would be looking at the 61.8%, but it will very seldom go beyond that level before reversing if it is on a strong uptrend. Lesson three, moving averages. Moving averages are defined as the closing prices of a stock averaged over n number of days. They do not predict price direction but rather define the current direction with a lag. That is simple moving averages. But as opposed to simple moving averages, exponential moving averages reduce the lag because they apply more weight to recent prices. So for example, you have a four day, you have a five day moving average, a simple moving average. Those five days are averaged equally with the same weight for each day. But with exponential moving averages, the weight of the last day is more is higher than the weight of the previous days because that is the most recent move. So exponential moving averages are more sensitive to price action. There are three ways to use moving averages. First, you use it as support or resistance. The second, you use them as buy or sell signals. And third, you use it as a proxy to volatility. Now, Marlin's Curves is an oscillator that makes use of three exponential moving lines, moving average lines. The 21-day exponential moving average, the four-day exponential moving average, and the eight-day exponential moving average. The first use of moving averages is as support and resistance lines. Now, when doing position trades or medium to long-term hold trading, now if you're a position trader, the most important EMA line is 21-day EMA. The 21-day EMA is suitable as support line for both swing trades and position trades. Look at this chart of MEG. The 21-day moving average shows that the general direction of MEG is up. A swing trader might buy when the price cro crosses above 21 DMA, DMA sorry, and hold as long as it stays above it. While price moves away from the 21-day moving average, 
it tends to retrace back to that line because the moving average is simply a price average. Now, when price breaks below that EMA21 line, a sell signal is generated. At this point, the 21-day EMA is now your resistance. So again, a reversal of rules from support as resist to resistance. If price successfully breaks above EMA 21 line, then a buy signal is generated once again. Now you hold your position as long as prices remain above the 21-day EMA line. The following chart shows the percentage gains that a swing trader might earn from this style of trading. Now, if you're a swing trader, you buy above EMA21 at the closing. Remember that swing traders do not have much time to monitor the charts during the day. So most often, they log in at the end of the day, check the closing price, and see if it is a buy. At this, at this point, Meg crossed above the EMA21 line. So when the swing trader checks out his charts, he would be buying this at the closing price of 346. Now he holds the position until the 21-day EMA line is broken. On Feb 21 on Feb 2016, his buy price at the close is 346, but on April 2016, the price closes below EMA21 and a swing trader sells his position at the closing price of 403. His gain is at 16%. Now he buys back his shares on May 2016 at the close at 405. He holds the position and sells it on May. Uh, and sells it on June, a month later, at a gain of 5.6%. Now, when you're a momentum trader, you do not use EMA21 as support line. You use the four-day EMA as your support line. Momentum traders include day traders and scalpers. You use the EMA4 line because it is a higher line And you want to protect your profits, as much of your profits as possible. So you use EMA4 line as your cut loss point. EMA21 support is just too deep for a momentum trader or a day trader who needs to take advantage of price spikes to maximize profit. Now the next chart shows how EMA4 is a more efficient support level for momentum traders. Now, this is the chart of MRC once again. A momentum trader would buy above the four-day EMA, not necessarily at the EMA 21. Because if he buys at the EMA 21, at the cross above the EMA 21 line, he might have to t wait longer for a move to happen. Now, a strong move happens most often when, a st when price crosses above the four-day EMA. This is what a momentum trader wants. Now, so you buy above the four-day EMA, you hold, and then you sell below the four-day EMA if you are a momentum trader. Now, I added the blue circle here because I wanted you to see the huge difference between selling at EMA four-day EMA4 and selling at the 21-day EMA breakdown. At the green circles, price crossed above EMA4. At the red circles, price crossed below EMA4 line and therefore a momentum trader sells. The blue circles are where price crossed below EMA21. 
if a momentum trader sells below these blue circles or below the EMA 21 lines, he would have lost a significant amount of these gains. The next slide quantifies these gains. Now you bought here at 0 0.076 above the EMA4 line. Price moves up along EMA4. And closes here below the EMA4 line at 0 0.099. A momentum trader, a scalper or a, position, or a day trader would sell your position at this point. His gain would be 30% if he sells at the break of EMA4. Now, if he sells at the break of EMA21 at the blue, la blue circle, his gain would only be 17%. Because it closed at 0 0.089. Now, if the momentum trader uh, on the next trade, the trader buys at the close at EMA4, above EMA4 line at 0 0.091. If he sells at the break below EMA4, he gains 46%. If he sells at the break below EMA21, he gains. 38 at uh, 32%. Still a huge difference. And apart from that, not only do you earn less, you also spend more time on the trade. Remember that a day trader does not like to to waste a lot of time on a single trade. He does not like to wait um, more than three days for a trade. Momentum trading and EMA4, the EMA4, EMA4 line is used as support. However, stocks that possess strong momentum, whether in an uptrend or in a downtrend, sometimes tend to detach from EMA4. In an uptrend, do not buy when prices are detached from the EMA4 line. Look at both the daily and weekly timeframes. Only buy if prices have reattached to EMA4 on both the daily and weekly charts. The EMA4 line is the momentum trader's best friend. Stick with it. So just to illustrate what I meant by that, take a look at the chart of IS. During its run, price tends to create a long green candle that moves away from the EMA support line. Now, most of, or maybe some of you might have been trapped in this green can, these long green candles at the top. Because the next day, the price returns to the EMA4 line with a red, long red candle at the end of the day. Notice how this pattern occurred four times in this chart. So you will see from this chart that prices always stick to EMA4 line. And if it detaches, the next day it tends to return back. So do not buy stocks that are far away from that green line. Look at this candlestick. This candlestick is detached from EMA4 after a strong run. Do not buy this closing price. Wait for price to reattach to the daily and weekly chart. Sorry, to the daily and weekly EMA4 lines. So the EMA4 line is down here. So wait for prices to go back. And then you can buy. You see that the next day, price went down, even overshot EMA4. Most momentum traders would have cut their losses right here. But the next day, price stabilized and went back up to the EMA4 line. In an uptrending high momentum stock, when prices have reattached to EMA4 line, buy. So we have a, here a candle on strong momentum, but prices detached from the EMA4 line. Wait for prices to go back down, and then you buy.
after that reattachment, a strong candle followed. Now you can also use moving averages as buy and sell signals. A bullish crossover is a buy signal. This happens when, number one, EMA4 is higher than EMA8 is higher than EMA21. Two, a bullish candlestick crosses above all three moving averages. So here's an illustration of what I mean. Here is Meg showing a buy signal. It satisfies the two conditions for a bullish crossover. First, the green EMA4 line is above the yellow EMA8 line is above the red EMA21 line. Second is, there was a bullish candlestick that crossed above all three moving averages. Now look at this chart of PXP. Can you locate the bullish crossovers? The first bullish crossover, oh, this is the second, sorry. Uh, this is the first, that was the second. At both of these, there was a bullish candle that crossed above the three moving averages. Your cut loss point is the candle that crosses below those, is when price crosses below those two candles. So these are, your, the bottom of these two candles are your new support lines of the uptrend. So you have a bullish crossover via a long green candlestick. You also have the EMA lines, the EMA4 is above EMA8, and the EMA8 is above EMA21. So just follow the trend and cut your losses if price goes below that green candlestick for the first crossover and for the second crossover. This means that the momentum has died down. So just keep holding until prices break below that line or unless you've met your target price or unless you use the minutes chart to get out of the trade. But the main idea is momentum stalls when price go down, goes down below that green line. But remember not to use this stop as your stop loss point on an intraday basis. Always wait for the closing prices. Now, sometimes it takes two bullish candles to make a crossover instead of only one. However, a crossover with only one candlestick is much preferred. If prices can cross over without hesitation, then the move afterwards is likely to be strong. Now let's talk about a bearish crossover. A bearish crossover is a sell signal. This happens when EMA4 is lower than EMA8 and EMA8 is lower than EMA21. A bearish candlestick crosses below all the moving averages. So there are also two conditions to meet, the EMAs and the candlestick. Now here's an illustration of a bearish crossover. This was the bearish candlestick. Oops, sorry. And it crossed below all three moving averages. EMA4 is lower than EMA8 is lower than EMA21. The bearish crossover is a signal to sell. Now let's look at this LTG chart. After the bearish crossover, a strong downtrend occurred. You see this 
long red line that cross below all three EMA lines, and EMA4 went below EMA8, went below EMA21. This is a bearish crossover. Now, after the bearish crossover, a strong downtrend occurred. At the next price point, price retested that moving average as resistance, but it failed to break it, resulting in a continued downtrend. Now, here's another example using brown. I numbered, this, I numbered the items so we could refer to them much easier as we discuss. This is number one. Number one seems like a bullish crossover. But can you guess why this is not a valid crossover? This is not a valid cross bullish crossover because the candlestick did not come from below EMA 21. The candlestick should swoop from below EMA 21 and go above EMA 4 line in one or two candles. But as you can see here, the candlestick was a series of candlesticks had already been consolidating above EMA 21 for several days. Now, although there is a long green candlestick that followed, this was a fake move. And immediately, price reversed back down. Now, number two, right here, was a one candle bearish crossover. Now, this is a valid bearish crossover because it met the two conditions. A one candle crossover suggests the strength of the move down. You would see that it was followed by a strong downtrend. Now, number three is a buy. It is a valid crossover, a valid bullish crossover, but notice that it was a two candle crossover. This suggests hesitation. The result of this hesitation is a sideways action before an actual move up. Now, number four seemed like a bearish crossover. There was a long red candlestick. However, EMA4 did not go below EMA8, and EMA8 did not go below EMA21. It stayed above EMA21 despite the bearish candle. Thus, this is not a valid bearish crossover. Now look at the fifth circle. This is number five. Is this a valid bullish crossover? Now number five is a valid bullish crossover, but it is a two candle crossover. The first small candle came from below EMA 21 and was followed by a long green candle. Because again, this was a two candle move, the result is a sideways action before the actual move up. Number three, we use moving averages as a proxy to volatility. Now we know that we can use the Bollinger Bands to see the volatility. We can also use the ATR indicator, but we can also use moving averages alone without those um, mentioned indicators as a proxy to volatility. This is where the eight-day 
exponential moving average becomes useful. The three moving averages, EMA4, 8, and 21, vary in relation to one another in a manner that suggests volatility. Now, when the moving averages converge, it suggests that volatility is low. Prices are locked within a box range as prices consolidate, and the moving averages are getting squeezed tighter together. Now, since prices are locked in a very small range, the result is a strong move in either direction, up or down. I remember Kin asking me yesterday, what is the result when prices are squeezed together? When I mentioned that Medco had a price squeeze at a certain point. The result of that action yesterday was a move, big move down. So it could go either way, a big move up or a mo big move down. So when prices start squeezing, and we're, or when moving averages start getting squeezed, it's time to take um, notice. Find bullish or bearish signals and find out whether this would be a profitable trade for you. So it's best to buy stocks that are low volatility because a big move is about to happen rather than buy stocks that are high volatility because that means you will get stuck in a range pattern for a long time. Because a big move up or down is followed by low volatility trading. See here, after a consolidation, price moved down. And then price is consolidated within the box again. And price moved drastically up. Then price consolidated again and then moved upwards in a big way. Now, during these strong moves, after the squeeze, the moving averages have diverged. When they diverge, it suggests that volatility is too high and needs to come back. The prices will settle down within a range once again, as prices consolidate, volatility lowers and moving averages squeeze once again. Then the cycle goes on and on. So instead of looking at the three averages as just three more lines on a chart, start looking at them as a function of volatility and they might start making sense to you. They have to be exponential, not simple moving averages. They have to be exponential moving averages because only EMA has the sensitivity to the price that is necessary to become a proxy for volatility. Now, at certain times, you might be able to use exponential moving averages with, with simple moving averages to verify supports and resistances. Exponential moving averages are sufficient for use by themselves in determining supports and resistances and buy signals, buy and sell signals. However, it could be combined with moving averages, SMA 100 or SMA 50, in order to provide additional confirmation of supports, resistances, and even breakouts. This is especially useful for, for position traders with longer time frames. Take, for example, this chart of MEG. You would find that at some points, prices made a bearish crossover, which for a momentum trader or a swing trader would already be a sell. The swing trader would sell because he needs to protect his gains and collect his capital and use that capital for the next best entry point. 
for a swing trader, that next best entry point is, again, the 50% retracement. However, a position trader has more patience and is willing to hold on to his position. Thus, a position trader may add the SMA 100 line and use that as his, as his cut loss point. In this MEG chart, notice how prices did bearish crossovers yet stayed above SMA 100 line. For the position trader, that uptrend is still valid. But for the swing trader and the momentum trader, that's already a sell. This is why you have to know what type of trader are you to know where to sell, where to buy, where to cut your losses, where to take profits. So this would be a position trader's chart. He would keep his position because it is still above the SMA 100 line. In the same way, the SMA 100 line could be used to confirm buy signals. Notice that this is a daily chart. Oftentimes, now in the daily chart, you would find that the EMA lines 8, 4, and 21 are converged, but at the same time, SMA 50 and SMA 100 are converged with them. This means that the price is so locked up in a range, prices are so tight that this is destined for a big move. When there is a bullish crossover in a price chart and the price also crosses above SMA 100 line, that increases the conviction that the stock is a buy. Now, this is a double crossover. This is what you call a double crossover. When price crosses above SMA 50 and 100 line, that is a bullish confirmation. It is a double crossover because there's a bullish crossover above EMA lines and also above the SMA lines, SMA 50 and 100 lines. Now, I'd like to provide an example when I used moving averages in trading ARA or ARANETA properties. I set the moving average lines in the call charts. Now, as explained earlier at the start of the lesson, ARA was, uh, so I added the EMA4, 8, and 21 lines. Now, ARA is highly volatile. So as I was able to trade this in and out simply by using moving averages and trend lines without looking at the indicators. But as an additional le lesson later, I used box trading as well. Um, I used Darvas boxes. We have a separate lesson on that. But for the purpose of this chart, you would notice that green line to the left, the fourth um, candlestick from the left, that set the high for the range. Now, when price crossed above that wick, that long wick, that was a signal to buy this stock. Now, because it already surpassed its previous high. Now, the first time I bought ARA was, was when it made a bullish crossover on April 22, 2016. The bid, ask, bid and ask spread was wide and the price action was fast because it was an illiquid stock. Now at that time, it had very high momentum. Because it had high momentum, I used, my tra I used trail stops to determine my exit points. So I bought at this bullish crossover right here. You can see that it was a two candle crossover there's a small line. There's a small candle that crossed above EMA 21. And the moving averages were aligned such that the green is higher than the yellow is higher than the red. I bought in tranches here in this candlestick and price closed at the ceiling at 232.
I was ready to sell the next day because price was severely detached from its EMA4 line. Price was so far away from the EMA4 line that I had to trail my stops. When you trail your stop, you use a specific price level at which a bridge below that level was a sell. Now, this was the result. Now, I, I'm not showing the, I'm sorry for showing the, you this portfolio, but I did not mean to brag about the earnings. My objective here is not to brag, but only to show you that huge profits can be made only using bullish crossovers or bearish crossovers to take profits. Naturally, sorry, there was a sell down the next day and prices reattached to the EMA4 line in the days that followed. Ara moved sideways for a few months. I traded the stock in and out through its ranges using signals from bullish and bearish crossovers. Now here are my entry points. I bought at those bullish crossovers that satisfied the two conditions. And here are some of my exits. These are bearish crossovers. The first one is a one candle crossover and the second one is a two candle crossover, a bearish crossover. Now, I don't always wait for bearish crossovers to sell. When prices are detached from EMA4, I already anticipate that it will soon reattach and that a bearish crossover is imminent. So I take profits ahead of the bearish crossover. A large part of being a successful momentum trader is knowing, is anticipating buy-ups or sell-downs. So I already know that this was bound to do a sell-down. At these points um, in the rectangles, prices are going to be sold down because they are far apart from EMA4. So notice the red candles that followed. I did not wait for bearish crossovers for a sell. Um, a large part of being successful is being ahead of the crowd. So if you want to be sure, if you're a prudent trader and you, you are able to hold on to your positions much longer, you would hold on to get bigger profits at the end of the trend. But if you're a momentum trader like me, I take profits once I see that it's in danger. Now, I also buy ahead of um, bullish crossover once prices are above EMA4 and set stops below. Below that, in case a cr bullish crossover does not happen, I am able to buy a small tranche a small first tranche or first batch before crossovers happen because I am bullish towards the entire um, movement of the stock. When the actual bullish crossover happens, then I complete my position. Naturally, buying ahead of a confirmed crossover has its risks. It is up to the trader to manage those risks. So again, it's all about your trading style, your personal trading style. What we are showing here are just benchmarks or rules to live by. But of course, you have your own personal styles uh, that would suit your, your, I mean, your tra trading personality. Now, let's talk about the relative strength index. I, I need a five-minute break for a while. Um, can you wait five minutes and I'll be back?
All right, I'm back. Thanks for waiting. I'd like to check your messages again, just in case someone has a problem with um, the webinar. Okay, I'll answer a few questions first. Um, yes, I would post the call chart settings later. No, actually, it's already in the webinar. And you can get a copy of the webinar. I'll post it. I'll post a copy of the webinar to the Facebook page or the link to the webinar. What other confluence? Uh, that's for FIBO. For Renan, what other confluences do you use except when the price is above EMA 21? Because sometimes the price goes in a range just what you showed on the EMA chart. Yeah. The next topics to follow are RSI. Fibonacci, chart patterns, what else? Yeah, those are the confluences that I use. Moving average, RSI, chart pattern, boxes. Yeah, boxes. Darvas boxes. Okay, let's go back. Lesson four, the relative strength index. What is the relative strength index? The RSI is an oscillator that was developed to indicate whether a stock is um, oversold and due for a bounce or is overbought and due for a correction. An oversold condition is where the RSI is below 7, 30, and an overbought condition is where RSI is above 70. However, that is not the only use of an RSI. In fact, I don't use these overbought and oversold conditions for RSI. I use RSI to determine the strength of the price movements now a strong price a strong rsi a strong price movement has a, a higher rsi while a weak stock has a lower rsi in a strong uptrend the price will often reach 70 and beyond for sustained periods and downtrends can stay at 30 or below for a long period of time when a stock stays above 70 for a long period of time, that indicates strength. And these are the kinds of stocks that you must take interest in. Many traditional traders would use this as oversold and overbought indicators so that they would buy the weakness and sell the strength. But when you use RSI in that way, um, it's a much more difficult trade because you are trading a weak stock. Whereas if you buy a stock that is already above the 70 line, you are more likely trading a stock that is already parabolic. You know that parabolic stocks are the ones that go on and on and on, just like Vita, just like Now and Ion in its previous runs. But basically, the indicator that a stock is bullish based on the RSI is if the RSI is above 50. The stronger a stock, the better the chances that it will continue to be strong. So the 50 line of the RSI is the midline. It tells you that if the RSI is above that, it's in a bullish area. If the RSI is below 50, it's in a bearish area. So when trading oversold conditions for RSI, your first resistance is the RSI 50 line. If it does not get past the RSI 50 line, then it will continue to be weak and you must sell that position. A higher RSI means that the buying pressure or the demand is strong. When the RSI goes above 70, 
We like it because it exhibits strength and momentum. I will talk about parabolics and why you should be trading these stocks in more detail later. So it's all a matter of mindset. Do not trade stocks that are weak. Trade stocks that are strong. They will give you higher profits in shorter amounts of time. Now we learned from the previous lesson that it's easy to trade using price action and moving averages alone. However, although the moving averages can serve as support and resistance, and they can tell you to buy or sell at crossovers, it requires that you are an active day trader so that you can catch the crossovers as they happen. The problem here is that you have to be there at the exact time that a bullish crossover happens. But things could happen quite quickly during trading time that you could miss the big move. This is where RSI becomes useful. The RSI provides clues and advanced signals as to whether a big move is about to happen or whether a trend will continue. When a technical indicator such as the RSI disagrees or moves in the opposite direction as the price it creates a powerful technical signal called a divergence. Okay? Again, a divergence is when a technical indicator such as the RSI disagrees or moves in the opposite direction as the price. Note that you can use other indicators to spot divergences. You can use MACD, you can use SDS, you can use MAC, um, CCI, etc. But we prefer to use RSI, diverge, RSI because RSI has many different functions. Therefore, you only need RSI to de determine divergences. You can use RSI to determine strength. You can use RSI to de determine parabolic conditions, etc. So why use um, any other indicator? There are two kinds of divergences, regular and hidden. There are also two biases for divergences, bullish and bearish. Let's first discuss regular divergences. A regular bullish divergence occurs when price creates lower lows, but the indicator creates lower, uh, sorry, the price creates lower lows, but the indicator creates higher lows. Oops, sorry. The current price trend is downwards. The divergence with RSI indicates that a reversal is about to happen. There is no time period, however, as divergences can result in a place without a price action I saw divergences can remain in place without a price action occurring anytime soon. Thus, divergences should only serve as complementary signals to moving average, crossovers, price range breakouts, etc. When spotting divergences, one must look at the closing prices of trends. Thus, instead of using a bar chart, which could be very confusing, I use the line chart which only plots points based on closing prices. You would see here that price is making lower lows while the indicator, the RSI, is making higher lows. This is a regular bullish divergence. Now let's try to spot a bullish divergence in this chart of food. Try to spot the bullish divergence. Remember that bullish divergences are found in downtrends. Now food has been on a long downtrend from its peak at 223. From December 2015 to January 2016, price created lower lows 
while RSI created higher lows. This is called a regular bullish divergence. There's their divergence right there. Now note that this divergence was found in both the daily and the weekly charts. Divergences are stronger if it is found in both the weekly and the daily charts. What followed was a price reversal. Um, if it's found in the monthly chart as well, then it's an even stronger signal. What followed was a price reversal. Price started to make higher lows as RSI continued to make higher lows as well. Again, sorry. So that's your... Now at this point, at the price reversal, price already agrees with the RSI because price had higher lows and RSI also had higher lows. This is what you call a bullish convergence. In contrast to a bullish divergence where price disagrees with RSI, a bullish convergence is when price agrees with the indicator. A price, a bullish convergence occurs when the price and indicator are making higher lows. A bullish convergence happens after a bullish divergence. Now here's another example. This is the chart of Felix Mining, or PX. Let's spot the div bullish divergences right here. Price made a lower low and RSI made a higher low. Price rebounded off their lows. After this bullish divergence, we got a bullish convergence where price made a higher low along with the RSI. My question is, how do you know when the bullish divergence is over and the bullish convergence is about to start? Divergences are only reversal signals. They warn us of a possible change in trend. But what tells us that this is the best place to buy? We need to find some bullish confluences. This time, I will look into the candlestick chart of Felix Mining. Then I will add the moving averages and retain the RSI. So here's the candlestick chart of Felix Mining. Here's your first clue. The candlestick closed above the 21-day EMA. So here's your first clue that it was time to buy the stock after the, bearish diver uh, the bullish divergence. The candlestick crossed above the 21-day EMA. We know that EMA21 is used as support and resistance lines for swing traders. A close above that is a buy signal. But that was not enough to warrant a buy. We have to prove that this is a strong upthrust. Now notice that although there was a crossover, the EMA lines do not follow the condition where in green, supposed to be higher than yellow, is supposed to be higher than red. So that's the reason why the price moved sideways for the next few days. Now the RSI resistance, now this is number one, along with that break above EMA21 line, the RSI's resistance was breached when the bullish candlestick occurred. Now look at the RSI. 
that level that which broke the day the bullish the bullish candlestick appeared was also the day when the RSI broke its resistance. Notice that there was a resistance to the left. RSI couldn't get past that level until this candlestick happened. Now the third indicator that this was a buy was this box. The price broke out from its box range, signifying bullishness. So now we have three indicators, the green candlestick, the RSI breach, and the box. Now there's only one problem. The bullish crossover was not valid because EMA 4 and 8 were not on top of EMA 21. Thus, a prudent trader would wait for this last confirmation to make a buy. If he had bought at number 1 at the close of the green candle, he could have been whipsawed for the next few days because it was followed by two red candles. Thus, we wait for that valid bullish crossover. That crossover happened here. That bullish crossover was accompanied by an RSI cross above 70. Now, that black line inside the circle was the RSI 50 level. Remember when I said earlier that a cross above RSI 50 is a sign of strength because the RSI from 50 above 50 is a bullish RSI area. Anything below 50 is a bearish RSI area, which indicates weakness. So now RSI cross above 50, it's in the bullish area. So buying above 50 tells us tells us that the possibility of an incoming uptrend is higher. Now, there are two ways you could enter this setup. You could enter with 50% allocation at number 1 and 2 if you're a momentum trader and then enter 25% at number 4 and 5 because the RSI crossed above 50 and then the remaining 25% at number 6. Notice that although number 4 was a valid crossover, the candlestick was not bullish because it closed the day at its lows. So we are not sure whether that would result in a green candle the day after. So again, we tranche by. We need the confirmation the next day. And number six was that confirmation. A prudent trader would wait for number six before buying in. But a momentum trader, a high-risk momentum trader would start buying at the cross above the box and above EMA 4 and 21. Another way to enter is to enter the trade at full allocation at the close above number 6. Now let's talk about regular bearish divergences. A regular bearish divergence occurs when price makes higher highs and the indicator is making lower highs. Again, the, um, the price trend, the prevailing price trend is upward. The indicator moves in the opposite direction. The price creates higher highs, but the indicator creates lower highs.
I would like to show you the regular bearish divergence in this PXP chart. Can you spot the regular bearish divergence? A bearish divergence happens during an uptrend. When a bearish divergence is spotted at the high, a bearish convergence follows. So here's your bearish divergence right here. A bearish convergence follows. The bearish convergence is when prices push downwards along with the RSI. A bearish convergence occurs when the price and the, and the indicator agree. A bearish convergence happens after a bearish divergence. So here's PXP's bearish convergence. Now remember that bearish divergences are only reversal signals. When you find this in a chart, it does not necessarily mean that you should sell straight away. Often, prices will continue to move up, as you can see in this chart, when there's a bearish divergence. You would find that um, if you look at the JGS chart, you would find that the bearish divergence on that chart has been there for months almost a year before the actual bearish convergence happened. So bearish divergences are just warnings. Now again, my question is, how do you know when the bearish divergence is about to transition into a bearish convergence and thus that it is time to sell immediately? Just like our previous example on PX, we look into the chart of JFC to find bearish confluences that will urge us to, to sell. Here is JFC's chart showing bearish divergence that turned into a bearish convergence. Here's the candlestick chart of JFC. Your first clue that a bearish convergence is about to happen is this bearish crossover. Oops. The candlestick closed below the 21-day EMA. Also, EMA 4 is less than EMA 8. RSI support was breached at number 2 when the candlestick bearish candlestick occurred. Number 3, price broke down from the box. Divergences tell you that price is about to reverse. Convergences are the result of these divergences. Each follows the other in a cycle called the divergence-convergence cycle. The cycle is important because it tells you what to expect next in a price chart. Here's an example of a price chart using the divergence-convergence cycle. Nickel made a bearish convergence here. It made lower highs in price and RSI. And then a bullish divergence occurred and then a, bu a bullish divergence and then a bullish convergence. A bearish divergence formed at the peak and the bearish convergence followed. Note that the green lines are convergences and the red lines are divergences. The cycle continues with a bullish divergence. So currently, nickel is in the bullish convergence cycle. When you wish to know where the price of your current position is headed, it is useful to plot the divergence-convergence cycles.
Now we go to the next topic. Hidden divergences. Regular divergences are useful in spotting reversals in trend. While hidden divergences, on the other hand, provide clues that the current trend is set to continue. This is useful for trend followers. A hidden bullish divergence happens in an uptrend. Price is making higher lows, but the RSI is showing lower lows. A hidden bullish convergence signals continuation of the trend. So here's your hidden bullish divergence. The current trend is uptrend. RSI goes up with the price and then RSI turns down making lower lower lows while RSI is well, price is making higher lows. This is a bullish hidden divergence. It signifies that the trend is about the trend will continue. So if you're a swing trader or a position trader, it is used this um, hidden bullish divergence is a good indicator for you. Take a look at this chart of Robinson's Land Corporation, or RLC. The general trend is up. From August 2016, price started to go down. but it bounced back, thereby creating higher lows in price. I'm sorry, prices starting, started to make lower highs, what I meant. A bearish, um, wait a minute, I'm lost. RLC, yeah. From, uh, but it bounced back up, thereby creating higher lows in price. At the same time, RSI created lower lows. This is a hidden bullish divergence and is a signal that price will continue to go up. So this tells you that you could buy that dip over to the right because the trend will continue to go up. Now, lastly, we've got the hidden bearish divergence. A hidden bearish divergence occurs in a downtrend. Price makes a lower high, but the RSI is making a higher high. A hidden bearish divergence signals that the, the trend will continue going down. So this is a hidden bearish divergence. The trend is downwards. The previous trend of the RSI is downwards and then RSI starts to move up. Sorry. This is the chart of LC. At these points, we spot hidden bearish divergences that signal the continuation of the strong downtrend. These are followed by a regular bullish divergence that signaled the reversal to the upside. Now, if you're a trend follower, then you should dedicate some time to spot some hidden divergence. If you do happen to spot it, it can help you jump in on the trend or hold your position. Now, RSI can also be used as an indicator of strength or weakness. As I mentioned earlier, a cross above 50 RSI indicates strength and a cross below indicates weakness. Now again, let's, let's look at the chart of MRC. Is this a strong or a weak stock based on the RSI? This is the daily chart. Where is the RSI? It is at 74.88. What did we say about 
um, RSI is going above 70, it is in a parabolic state. Okay. Now this is the weekly chart. It's also parabolic about 70, above 70. And this is the monthly chart. Now in monthly charts, across above 50 is also a sign of strength. Monthly charts rarely go above parabolic levels, but across above 50 is already a sign of strength. So you can see from all time frames that MRC is strong in this daily, weekly, and monthly charts. Now going back, the RSI daily of MRC is 74. The RSI weekly is 70. So this poses a small problem. When RSI daily is higher than RSI weekly, then prices could consolidate for a while. The ideal situation is that the RSI weekly should be greater than the RSI daily. This signifies that fear is stronger than greed. If RSI weekly is greater than RSI 70, fear is stronger than greed. Therefore, the price is still not overextended. When RSI daily is greater than RSI weekly, greed is stronger than fear. Therefore, prices could be overextended and might be due for a consolidation. I'm not saying tomorrow, I mean next Monday, but consolidation will happen as long as RSI daily is low is higher than RSI weekly. Now here's another strong stock. We have Security Bank or SECB. The relative strength index is at 71.26. Right now, is it, it is at its all-time high. When a stock breaches its all-time high, that stock is bound to make more highs. Do not be afraid to buy stocks that are making all-time highs because there are no more resistances to stop its price. Sec B breached its all-time high yesterday, and although it seems like it will retest the previous high, so it might go back down to consolidate, the consolidation is likely to be shallow because it already breached its all-time high. In other words, all the sellers that are stuck on top at that all-time high of Sec B have already been bought out or are already at break even. So what you have left are the long-term investors or the st strong hands. None? Ayun, Sinel. Clarification on the RSI weekly being higher than the RSI daily. Um... If you notice, strong stocks like Ion, Ara, Poppy, MIC, when it was still MIC before it was IPM, the RSI Weekly, let's show the charts. I'm not sure if you can st still see them. The RSI, let's look at Ara. August 15. Ayan. Good example, ARA. Check out the weekly chart of ARA. It entered parabolic state or the RSI entered 70, 71 on the week of 
August 15. Right? It's August 15. It entered parabolic state on the daily chart on August 22, but it failed. But on the weekly chart, that RSI was sustained from August 15 until August 30. So if the RSI weekly reaches parabolic status earlier than the RSI daily, the move is bound to be strong. Notice here that although ARA failed to hold the RSI 17, the daily, after August 22, because the RSI weekly held, there was a quick bounce in RSI daily above parabolic state. In the weekly chart, it entered parabolic state at close of 295. The daily chart failed yung 297. It reached parabolic state on ano palang on the peak na already at the peak, so at the peak, the RSI of ARA was at seventy seven at the close of three ninety. Seventy seven point twenty two on the weekly, seventy seven point thirty three on the daily. I'm sorry, seventy seven point. 33 on the daily. So at this stage, because RSI daily is greater than RSI weekly, then fear is higher. Uh, greed is higher than fear. Ibig sabihin, people are buying because they are greedy. Therefore, the buying is emotional. The buying is impulsive. The buying is irrational. This caused prices to drop the next seven days the next week whereas when rsi weekly is higher than rsi daily fear overcomes greed this means people are still scared people are still scared to buy because they're not sure if prices will go up in that case there are still a lot of buyers waiting to buy that is the reason why prices went up. No? Rarely do people look at RSI weekly. I think older traders are more accustomed to using RSI weekly. But the daily traders, the fast traders would rather look at the daily charts. And if you do that and you only buy parabolics based on the daily charts, while the RSI weekly is n lower than the RSI daily, the chances are you will lose money. The same as what happened here in ARA. So RSI weekly, greater than daily, price went up. Now when RSI daily was greater than RSI weekly, price dropped down. Because greed was higher than fear. Diba? Buy the fear, sell the greed. Let's look at ARA. There are lots of detachments with ARA. You find here, detached, diba? Candlestick. Candlestick is attached here. This one. Well, you can buy that because the candlestick is bullish. You don't have to wait for the next day. Hammer na yan eh. It's already bullish. But if the candlestick is an iffy, like this, Oh, ito, this candlestick is bearish, right? It reattached to EMA4, but it's bearish. And then it closed above EMA4 and not on EMA4. So you still have the chance to buy at EMA4 the next day. Detached pa rin to. This candlestick is still detached because the closing price is above. You could have bought here when it reattached or here when it reattached. So it depends on the candle. If the candle's already bullish when it attached, you can buy it. When the candle is bearish, like this one, you have to wait the next day. Ito. This is a dodgy. What happened? A dodgy is a signal of reversal, right? 
So you have your uptrend. And then if you look at the minutes charts, it's all a matter of perspective, really. I, you can't look at far, far behind pala sa call charts in minutes. And it, imagine mo na lang, itong minutes chart nito, bearish yan. Kasi the, the day started here, went up here, and then ended here. So if you're looking at the hourly chart, this is a bearish chart. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm referring to this pala. And then it's followed by a doji. So this is a signal of reversal. So you could buy this. Because if you look at it, nag re na dun sa um, EMA line. And then the candlestick is a doji. This is why it gapped up the next day. But since the gap up, detached na naman, hindi successful yung ano, uptrend. The uptrend failed. It has to reattach and create a stable base. A create a stable base before it actually moves up strongly. So it's a bullish candlestick to. This is a hara this is a harami. It's a small candle inside the big red candle, a green candle within a small red within a red uh, a small green candle within the body of a red candle. So this is a harami candlestick. So it's bullish. You can buy that. Now for the next few days, next sideways lang naman siya eh. Then a big move again. So the answer is if the candlestick is bullish, you can buy it. If it's bearish, you wait the next day. So, Meg, yeah, you Meg, yeah, that there are even a lot of diverge, a lot of more indicators that we need to include, like the boxes and the Fibonacci, which we have yet to study. We still have a session next week, huh? September 10 and 17. To. So, you have an 8 to 12 next week again. Yeah, but a screen yon chart. Why is it it's showing on my screen, um, Leo, on my other PC? You can't see my chart. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, ABG has a daily. ABG has a daily RSI 70, weekly is third, RSI 64. Ayun. Daily is 71. Oh, mali yata to. Daily is 71. Weekly is... So, magko-correct yan. Takita mo to. Do you see the pattern? You see the pattern in this? Green. Chuchupitahin lang. Then a series of reds. Green, series of reds. Green. Never nag-sustain yung long green candles niya. Now, here... Ang bullish dito. The RSI broke out of weekly resistance. That line. But the daily is higher than the weekly. And it's detached. So pwede siyang bumalik dito, di ba? Sa EMA4. Notice the pattern again. Green, 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 red. Green, green, green. Mag-red ulit yan. This is a Jap stock, so it's typical. Long green and then red. You know, a lot of the movement of the stock depends on the DNA. Because often, stocks have their own jockeys, and jockeys have their own, um, what's this, attitudes towards trading. They have their own habits. Notice from Jap stocks, Jerry Ang Ping stocks, they're always wicks. Consolidation wicks, wicks. Ito, another example of a ang ping stock is this. Now, this is going um, away from fund, uh, technicals already. I'm just showing you that each stock has its own personality. While 
most of the stocks follow um, certain conventions. These Jap stocks, like this, this, notice ang daming, ang daming ano, wicks. If you trade this, you get whipsawed in and out many, many times. That this, the, um, ang pink stocks are this. Sorry. Ni hao. See, see that pattern? Long trend, long down. Long trend, long down trend. Ni hao, ang dami ring wicks. They're all handled by the same jockey. Notice then the pattern. Strong green and then a series of reds. Strong green, a series of reds. Strong green, series of reds. Notice. Gio. Also the same jockey. So many wicks. But that's going again, going away from the topic. ABG. Notice how RSI became parabolic here. After a long green candle, nahulog ulit. So it's so hard for RBG to sustain its parabolic status. Para siyang mid. But the bigger pattern is still an uptrend. Ano siya? It seems like it's going to make a rounding pattern, rounding bottom pattern. You see that? Cup. It's a cup or a saucer. RSI is bullish, very bullish. The daily, you just have to I know, hang on to your seats if you really want to hold this. Bullish, the medium term, but short term, range. Diba? It's still inside the box. Until it breaks this, this box, still gonna go. It could revisit EMA 21. Lagi naman siya, it revisits EMA 21 all the time. Hindi siya nakokontento sa EMA 4 lang. EMA 21. So, the personality. So, would you mind sharing? Yes, I will send you the links. I will upload this. Ayun. Parabolic. A stock becomes parabolic when it's RSI is above 70. Above 70 in the daily or the weekly charts. If RSI weekly is parabolic and RSI daily is not parabolic, it is likely that daily will follow weekly and will result in a much stronger move. Like that example of ARA earlier. Another example, maybe... Ngayon lang nagparabolic ang weekly nito. So, I think it's now. What date is this? And notice now. Si now. It went parabolic weekly nung April, end of week of April 4, 2016. And a strong move happened afterwards, right? April 4, 2016. Now, if you look at the daily chart, it also went parabolic on the same week. So, since the Ito, above 70 siya, nasa 82 siya. Since the parabolic is supported by the weekly parabolic, a strong move ensued. Sa so weekly, 70 siya, tapos sumunod pa siya. Nag-82 like din siya. Sinabayan na niya yung daily. Nag-87 like pa yung parabolic niya. At this point, 82.
At this point, there was a para burst. Prices broke below 72. Not as the consolidate siya. And prices started to create lower highs. So the problem with RSI daily being higher than RSI weekly is that there's a big risk of a para burst. This is theory ni spy frat na um, when a RSI daily is higher than RSI weekly, it's a parabolic high risk. I think it happened with ION. Prices kept going up. Where's ION, by the way? And then prices dropped because at this point, it was a parabolic high risk. The RSI daily is higher than the RSI weekly. But it's 99 peak niya. On September 20, week of September 20, RSI weekly is at 90. RSI daily is at 91. And it entered the parabolic high-risk area wherein price dropped drastically right after. So if you're trading a really strong stock, you start taking in profits little by little when RSI daily is higher than weekly. Of course, you don't have to take everything out agad. Tranche sales lang. Tapos, if it's confirmed by a candlestick like this, RSI daily is less than weekly, is higher than weekly, tapos you get a doji right here, it's really time to sell. Because you have two bearish factors. Plus the other bearish factor is yung bearish divergence here. So you have three, bearish divergence, parabolic high risk, and bearish candlestick. So you can't just use one indicator. You have to use two or three. So what if weekly yung sumunod sa daily parabolic? Kung sumunod siya, hindi good. As long as weekly is higher than daily, it will result in a strong move. But if weekly is lower than daily, pwede mag sideways muna siya until maka-catch up yung daily. Tingin nga ng food. Food. Seventy-seven daily. Sixty-six weekly. Hindi pa parabolic ang weekly, JJ. Oh, it's not even up above seventy yet. When when looking at parabolics, you use. 30 is 30, 70 because you get less whipsaw. When you're trading intraday, you can use the 14, 30, 70. But when using, when looking at parabolics on a weekly basis and a daily basis, use 30, 30, 70. Because if you look at it using um, 14, 30, 70, parabolic na siya, di ba? So weekly. But still, daily is still higher than weekly. Daily is 86. Weekly is 79. So kahit na umakit pa siya, so you have, two, you have a factor going against you, parabolic high risk, plus this trend line. Iwan pa siya dito. Ito na susunod mong resistance, 140. 145 until 157 ang susunod mong ano, risk area. And then you draw the trend lines. Check out the trend lines. Nandun na siya, oh. So, ang dami mo ng kalaban. Ito pa isa. 133. Ah, lumang pa siya sa 133. So, 135. There's a resistance at 135. Yung candlestick na yan, oh. That set of candlesticks. Mm -hmm. So you have this resistance, that resistance, that resistance, and at this resistance, may intersection ng trend line and um, resistance line and ano, parallel Darvas resistance and an RSI resistance here. Sa 70.
So, parabolic high risk, tama si Leo. Look at the cut loss points and not the, look at the trail stops and not the target price all the time. What else? Do you have any more questions? I have, you, the rest of the lessons are, um, the theories are in the videos. The ones I use for um, the previous uh, webinar, but I'm planning to add more charts for next week. So how do you draw correct trend lines and SR lines? Trend lines, basta two or more, there are not many kinds of trend lines. Kunyari, ito medyo, ano tong si, tanggalin natin to lahat. Lakihan natin. Oh, ayaw niya. It won't show in go to webinar if I maximize the screen. So it we don't have a choice. So trend line. Diba as long as there are two or three points. Two or more points. But there's such a thing as an inner trend line and an outer trend line. Tanggalin natin yung EMA so we can see. Say for example, food. Yan ang outer trend line niya, diba? Ang inner trend line niya ito. Notice that there's also resistances at certain points inside. There are in trend lines inside the trend lines. Ayan, that's the inner trend line. It supports and resistances within the trend lines. Those are inner trend lines and these are outer trend lines. Basta two or three trend line na yan. Ito, this is trend line yan. Notice that it was broken. Pero si food, meron pa siyang bigger trend line. The, the fact is, you can, depending sa style ng traders, traders, some traders use wicks, some traders use bodies only. So if you're a long-term trader, di gamitin mo na lang yung monthly chart para mas, mag mas malino yung trend line mo. There's your trend line. Si food, falling wedge, right? Broke out of the falling wedge. So, in the week, in the monthly chart, it's very bullish. Falling wedge breakout. Trend line breakout. And then weekly chart. If you want to be more um, detailed, do ka titingin sa maliliit na trend line. Kung gusto mo chupitahin and take advantage of the small swings, Ito yung trend line mo. Diyan ka magbabuy and sell sa lower and upper trend line. But if you use, you want to be even more detailed, use the daily trend line. That's where you buy and sell, which the range is not very big, so not a very good uh, trading range. So this can be 1, 2, Three, four, five, six, seven. Tapos yan na yung up trust, and that's it. Pading seven na to. Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Remember that pattern was also in PXP, guys. But note that it often fails. So you have. Here, PXP. Yan yung pattern na sinasabi ni Leo. One. Nakita mo reaction after, oh. One. One, two. This, this week. Three, four, five, six, seven. And then that up thrust. Off topic. <laughs> okay. Kaila, kapag ba magkaibang time frame, kailangan ba magkaiba rin yung RSI setup? No, no, James, better to use the same setup on all time frames. The reason I use the no, 14 in intraday because it needs to respond faster to the price action because it's a minutes chart.
But when comparing daily and weekly, use the same. Because mali yung mga conclusions mo if you use, ano, if you use different RSI settings. One setting is using a 14 day and the other is 30. You won't arrive at a consistent conclusion with regards to the relative strength of the weekly and the daily movements. Pag RSI ang ginamit for intraday chart, because when I use RSI for intraday, I own the objective is to buy and sell within the day. So I'm not comparing the minutes chart with any daily or weekly chart anyway. So I'm in it for the moment. Because RSI 14, mas mabilis niya madedetect kung nag-breakout na yung RSI kesa pag ginamit mo RSI 30 sa 30-day. Although, higher day RSI, RSI 30, it's smoother, it's less prone to whip sauce. That's why ginagamit ni Spy for spotting parabolics and, ano, uh, and comparing daily and weekly because it's smoother. And a 14-day RSI is whipsawish, but it is effective for intraday trading. So when I, when I, I always include the wicks, depends on the body of knowledge, the waivers, people who study Elliott waves always include wicks. People who study um, Ichimoku use the body in the weekly chart. People who study Darva's boxes include the wicks all the time. But notice that the difference is not that big. Or when you plot Fibonacci ratios, some people use add the wicks, some people use the body, but it try to compare side by side, the difference is not that big. The thing is, pag, if you want a more refined, um, less noisy chart, always go to the weekly chart. If you're spotting patterns, go weekly. If you're spotting um, ranges for intraday trades, go minutes and daily. It depends on your objective. So pag position trader ka, sa weekly ka lang at sa body ka lang. If you're a day trader, isama mo yung week at ang gamitin mo ay minutes charts. Of course, high risk, high slope, Again, talaga. Um, high risk, high reward, di ba? If you trade higher slopes like Vita, your risk is high, your reward is high. That's why you can't control the price movement, but you can control your trade plan. So if you have a high slope stock, taasan mo yung cut loss point mo. Imbis na 5% from the high ang Imbis 10% from the high ang cut loss point mo, gawin mo 5% lang. That's why if you have a high risk, your stops must be higher. Tighter stops ang tawag nila, di ba? Kung sa meg ang stop loss mo ay, for, ay ano, um, a drawdown of 10% from the high, pag vita ang tinatrade mo, ang stop loss mo, 5% lang. So you have to change, adjust your trading plans according to the stock that you are trading. That's why, again, you have to know position trader ka ba? Swing trader? Kasi you want to protect as much. The, high, the faster they go up, the faster they go down. So you have to make your stops closer to the price. Nakita mo yung ginawa ng food kahapon from the ceiling, nag-sell down to 127. So it went up fast, it'll go down fast. So your stop loss level should also be high. So ito, when you're trading, the rule of thumb when you're trading a momentum stock. When you're trading a momentum stock um, like that, because prices are moving irrationally by now, right? Sobrang taas, sobrang bilis. Ang gagamitin mo ay trail stops. That's also the rule in parabolics. Set a price at which kung bumaba doon, benta mo na. Huwag ka natitingin doon sa ano, indicators because it's moving irrationally already. It's overbought. It's at the, it went past resistance but the daily RSI is 
higher than the weekly, so high risk na yan. So mag-trail stops ka na lang. Say if you have food, ang closing price niya for a, 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 in a momentum trade, momentum, di ba? Ang closing price ng food is 135. So the rule of thumb is it should not go lower than 135 on Tuesday. If it does, then the momentum is gone and you have to sell. If it goes to 135 na unchanged, warning na yon, benta mo na. Lalo na pag 134, yun ang confirmation mo that it's a sell. As long as it stays 135, hold mo lang. So your trail stop is 135. Ganun. Notice how, is observe yung sa ticker, when a stock is going is dropping, no, long drops, and then it suddenly goes to unchanged during the day, bumibilis ang akit niya because that is a signal for momentum traders to buy. If a stock is dropping, tas naging unchanged siya, naging yellow siya, it went back to yesterday's price. If the dropping stock went back to yesterday's price, ibig sabihin wala ng sellers. It's ready to go up. On the other hand, if a rising stock goes back to unchanged, ibig sabihin wala ng buyers. It's time to sell. I'd, I'd like to show that in a chart. Hmm. Ito kasi mga obvious choices recently. That's why I'd like to... Ito, at this point, di ba? Ang closing price nito ay 289. And then here, the gap up, closing price at 297. 297 ang closing price ng candle na to. The next day, ang closing price at 296. It's lower than the previous previous day. A high risk, high momentum stock na to. So you have one factor, bearish candlestick. It closed the day below the previous day. And then the price is detached from EMA4, 2. You have two signals already. Three minutes. Three minutes. Four, eight, and 21. Tapos for confirmation ito. Ayan. Yung food, you saw that it was... In a range, right? Nasa range siya. Support and resistance. Nasa range siya dito. Place na to. And then at this point, nasira yung range. Ang high nito ay 94. At this candlestick, basta pag nakita niyo gumawa ng range, tingnan niyo anong high nito. 94 ang high. So pag na-break yan, bili ka na kagad. I don't have to think anymore. Kasi broken na. Nakita mo nag-range siya, paulit-ulit siya dyan. 94. Just remember that number. When it broke 94, buy na yan. But if you had, uh, but if you looked at your, ay, sorry, confusing, at your EMAs, nag-crossover na siya nung 93 pa lang. Here? May crossover na dito, di ba? It's a two-candle crossover because ito yung una, ito yung pangalawa. Buy signal na siya. So you're able to buy bago pa mag-break out if you followed the EMA. Tapos, you have another indicator that supports your buy. You have the SMA 100 here. It crossed above SMA 100 here and it did a bullish crossover dun sa EMAs. So dito sa 93, bili ka na agad. Your confirmation that you did the right thing is when it broke, breaks out of 94, of, of the 94 high. So, ano pa yung indicator mo na tama yung buy mo dun sa ano? Look at RSI. Anong level yung RSI dito? 54. So, at this point pa lang, bullish na yung RSI. And at the time that it crossed the moving average here, there were th three things happened. A bullish crossover, a confirmation of a crossover above SMA 100, yung bullish confirmation, and the breach of RSI resistance line here. Tatlo na agad yung bullish factors, so buy na buy na yan. Nakita mo na untog siya dito sa 70. But, 
what, three minutes? In three minutes, nasira niya ulit. So, the fourth, the confirmation is, the, the fourth confirmation is the breakout of the box, of the range. So, buy na buy na yan, hold na hold na yan, kasi hindi naman siya nasisira, bumababa sa EMA4, oh. dire direct siya lang siya. Diba? So, once it breaks out of the box, do ka na tumingin sa EMA4. Will it hold? If it holds, just keep holding. Tapos dito, this is where I sold. It broke below. I followed my rules. I sold here kasi nasira yung EMA4. E momentum stock to. So I sold at 120. Tapos, after mo mag-sell, maghintay ka. Wait for a pattern to form. Now, the pattern that formed was this. Gumawa ng triangle, di ba? Now, this triangle is neither bearish nor bullish. Ayusin natin triangle. This is a symmetrical triangle. A symmetrical triangle is neither bearish nor bullish. It's neutral. So, you notice that it went up and down. So, as watching this triangle, ano nakita kong, aba, nasa dulo na siya. Pag nasa dulo na siya, hintayin mo na, bibili ka ba o hindi. So, hihintay mo na direction. If it breaks this line, uh, sorry, if it breaks this line, break out, bilin mo. If it breaks that line, wag na, iwan mo, pabayaan mo na. So, since it broke the line here, it was a buy. So, I bought back again here. Actually, I didn't buy at the triangle breakout. Hinintay ko for confirmation na masira itong previous high. Previous high niya. Previous high niya was 126. Ito yung movement afterwards. Dito ako bumili sa 126. A, a, a trader who trades with triangles bought here. A trader who trades with Darvas boxes buys here. So binili ko yon. Tapos, here, I just sold to take profits because I went to MRC. 